I think often about the questions we do not yet know to ask because discoveries yet to come, but when they arrive, will put us in a new vista, a new place to stand, enabling us to see questions undreamt of and unimagined before we got there. So when I, again, lay awake at night, I ponder what kinds of questions lay beyond our reach. Because the questions that we even know how to pose, they're there. Those are not even interesting to me anymore because we knew how to ask the question. I want to know the question that is beyond everyone's reach. Hmm. And by definition, I can't because we haven't gotten there yet. But that doesn't mean I, I shouldn't dream of that frontier. As a scientist, you must learn to love the questions themselves because you don't always have answers at all times to all the mysteries you confront. What you learn when you study science in general, but astrophysics especially, that you no longer invoke your senses to judge what makes sense, or you no longer invoke your personal philosophies to judge what should be true. The universe is what it is, and it really doesn't care about your senses. What we've learned is that the universe is what we measure it to be, not what we want it to be, not what feels good, not what only has to make sense to our five senses. Our five biological senses forged in the plains of Africa, you know, a million years ago, uh, uh, half a million years, whatever, whatever what's the latest the biologists tell us, is those senses to prevent us from getting eaten by a lion are very different from what you need to grasp the universe. And so this is why mathematics is so potent, because it takes us out of our senses and enables us to still probe the reality of what the universe is. I wonder if, in fact, the human intellect is sufficient to actually decode the full operations of this universe in which we live. Ah. And it's not specifically an astrophysical question, it's just more, we are in, an intelligent species because we defined ourselves that way. <laughs> we don't have the benefit of another species to compare ourselves with against whom we might fail miserably. <laughs> and so when we compare ourselves to chimps, we sit up righteously and say, well, we have poetry and the Hubble telescope and philosophy, and the chimp just stacks, stacks boxes to reach a banana. Yet there's only 1% difference in our DNA. But then you'll say, what a difference that 1% makes. And I would say maybe that 1% DNA difference corresponds with an equally small difference in the intelligence between a chimp and humans. And you say, I can't believe that. No, no, no. Well, imagine some other species that visits us that's 1% along on that same scale, smarter than us. Consider, the smartest chimp does what our toddlers can do. And there's no way you will explain to a chimp, well, I'll have dinner ready at 6.30, can you pick up some, some juice on the way home? That, the simplest human thoughts are inconceivable to a chimp. And their talents are about what our toddlers can do. So let's get back to this 1% smarter alien that we've discovered. Corresponding this analogy, we now say, what would we look like to them? Well, they would roll Stephen Hawking forward after combing the human species, and they'd say, this one is slightly smarter than the rest <laughs> because he can do astrophysics calculations in his head like little Timmy over here, <laughs> who, who just came home from preschool. Oh, 
Timmy, you just composed three sonnets. Isn't that cute? Let's put it up on the refrigerator door. Oh, you just derived the fundamental law of calculus. Isn't that cute? Put it up on the refrigerator. Their simplest thoughts would transcend our deepest thoughts. And maybe they, to them, it is obvious what dark matter is and dark energy. Maybe to them, particles popping in and out of existence is a trivial exercise in their understanding of the multidimensional space-time continuum. And we are here groping at the sides of a wall, not knowing how tall, wide, or deep it is, because we have the limits of the human physiology evolved off the plains of Africa just to try to understand the entire universe. So I lose sleep on that question each night. What do you think are the odds that there is life elsewhere in the universe? Uh, they must be high, and mm. I'll tell you why. People say, well, have you found life yet? Well, no. Well, there, you know, that's like going to the ocean. This has been said before, taking a cup of water, scooping up, and say, there are no whales in the ocean, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Here's my data, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you, you need a slightly bigger sample. And so if you look at, for example, what we call the radio bubble, this is the sphere around Earth, centered on Earth, which is the farthest our radio signals have reached in the galaxy. And they're about 70 light years away. We've been transmitting radio signals inadvertently leaking into space for about 70 years. 70 light year radius sphere. Well, how big is the galaxy? Well, shrink that sphere down to maybe the size of a BB, and then the galaxy on that scale would be the size of this stage. That's how far our radio signals have traveled. And those aren't even the ones we sent on purpose. The ones we sent on purpose have traveled much less. So no, we haven't actually um, reached as far into the galaxy as we'd like before we would say definitively that there's no one intelligent living today. But here's some very simple facts. I can review them in 90 seconds. You look at the formation of the Earth and the earliest sign of fossil life. Subtract a few hundred million years at the beginning of Earth when Earth was a shooting gallery. Earth was still accreting the, the, the birth materials of the solar system. It's hostile to complex chemistry over that time. Not fair to start the clock then. Wait a couple hundred million years, now start the clock, and wait around and see when you have the first signs of single-celled life. At most, 400 million years. At most. Earth has been around for four and a half billion? So Earth, without any help from us, with basic ingredients found throughout the universe, managed to create life, simple though it was. So, and Earth, one of, you know, eight planets, get over it. Uh, <laughs> what, uh, one of, sorry. <laughs> Earth, well, oh, an ordinary star, uh, to suggest, and, and what, what are the ingredients of life? The number one atom in your body is hydrogen. Number two atom is oxygen, together making mostly water that's in you. Next is carbon in this order. Next is nitrogen, next is other stuff. My favorite element, other, yeah. <laughs> you look in the universe, the number one element in the universe is hydrogen. Next is helium, chemically inert, couldn't do anything with it anyway. Next is carbon, I think I left out oxygen there. Next is oxygen, next is nitrogen, one for one. We're not even made of odd things. The most common things in the universe are found here on Earth and we're made of them. And carbon, one of the most chemically fertile, the most chemically fertile element on the periodic table. It's not a surprise, we're carbon-based. Life is just the extreme expression of complex chemistry. So that's what life, that's what biology is. So all these people who want to imagine, imagine, because they remembered their chemistry class that, that silicon sits right below carbon on the periodic table. So it bonds similarly to carbon, so they want to imagine silicon-based life. I'm saying, okay, fine, but you don't have to. There's five times as much carbon in the universe as silicon. There's no need to even have to go there. We got enough 
to imagine just simply with the carbon atom at the center of these, of these huge biological molecules. Point is, it happened relatively quickly with the most common ingredients in the universe. To now say life on Earth is unique in the universe would be inexcusably egocentric. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh, okay. um. <laughs> all right. the, the tribalistic urges that we all have to divide ourselves and, and exaggerate what is different rather than absorb what is similar, it's, 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 it's extraordinary. Oh, you're, you're, you were born on this other line in the sand? That's reason enough for me to harm you, possibly even kill you. You, you sleep with different members of your own species than I do? You're an enemy. You worship these gods instead of these gods or that god or no god, and it's not my god, I'm going to kill you for this. Think about all the reasons we come up with to commit violence upon one another. And all I'm saying is that if you ascend Earth, sure, go to the moon. Go out where you now see Earth suspended in space with no hint that help is going to come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. That is a cosmic perspective. And you know who had that perspective? Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell. Because we went to the moon to explore the moon and we looked over our shoulder and discovered Earth for the first time. Here's what Edgar Mitchell said. He said, you develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so petty, you wanna grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. <laughs> wow. My boy was feeling the cosmic perspective. The point is when you step away, there, you don't see the national borders, you don't see, and, and I, I make reference to aliens, back to your, your favorite sub subject, if, if an alien came upon Earth and sees this one species, Homo sapiens, so oh, they, they, they've spread all over the world, that's great, we love that. Um, let's look a little closer. Oh, wait a minute, they're harming them, and they're killing them, and they're riding it over here, and, and why? Oh, because the, their skin color is differently reflective of sunlight than their skin color. Or they're worshiping, the, and, and they will learn all of this about us, and they'll rush back home and report that there's no sign of intelligent life on Earth. <laughs> Try not to ever forget that the history of this exercise, this beautiful exercise where we find out where we fit in this great unfolding of cosmic events and phenomena, that the larger grows the area of knowledge, the bigger that area grows, just remember, so too grows our perimeter of ignorance. It may be that as much as we think we know, as much as we know we know, as much as the more things that we ultimately learn, for all we know, we could be steeped in the center of infinite ignorance, which then provides job security forever for scientists. <laughs> Robert Krowich. Neil Tyson.